some of the acting, uh, I guess, was the extended version. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. Is the version. That's right. All right, we all get our coffee and. We continue with the book of Jeremiah. Yes. We don't have to make any comments anymore about the enacted sign since you guys did such a good job. Thank you. All right. What's the big picture of the book? Let me see. Hold on for a second. Okay, wait, wait. Hold on for a second. Where am I with my notes? <laughs> All right. So we have here, we're dealing with Jeremiah, the, we, call it, we call him the prophet with a broken heart. Isaiah would say to Hezekiah, don't fight, God will fight for you. However, in Jeremiah says to Zedekiah, don't fight, and neither will God. All right. Jeremiah was sensitive enough to weep for the sins of the people, but he was also bold enough not to shy away from an unpopular message. At first he felt feeling too young, unqualified, and shy, but soon he was going to become uncompromising and bold. Jeremiah was not only to speak a message, but be God's message. For example, he was not to marry. So his life was going to be a, a message to the people. All right? And we can see that Jeremiah's heart was broken. Why? Because God's heart is broken. So who is the original reader? The original reader, who do you think he's writing to? Exactly. Judah. Judah. And where is Judah? Exile. They're in exile. Very good. All right. And so what's the reason written? Why did he write to the original reader in exile? What is the main point? Why did he write this book? There's still hope. Huh? There's still hope. There's still hope. Okay, good. Yeah. That will be the second part. First part would be the reason written is telling the original readers why they are in exile, all right? Why, they are, why 586 happens, all right? It is a bit of a, yes, you, you're right, there is hope, Ali, but it's not like, not like Isaiah, where the second half of the book is all about hope and comfort. We call that the big book of comfort. In Jeremiah, we only have a, a small little book of comfort, which is chapter 30 to 33. And for the rest, it's all bad news. It's like uh, one speaker would say it is like uh, trying to figure out the big picture of Jeremiah and being, not being able to get any structure in the book and say what was the plan of the author and she realizes when she was looking up in the sky and she looked at clouds and there were like dark clouds and there were big clouds and small clouds they were higher in the sky lower in the sky but they're all moving towards one place because the 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 wind was moving everything into one direction and it's like it's like the book of jeremiah you have big different pieces here and there it doesn't seem to be very organized what brings all those different pieces together is one thing and that it's all moving towards 586. Mm. All right, it's all moving towards 586. And the main idea is, is it because they have sinned? Well, yeah. Is it because they have broken the covenant? Yeah, okay, yeah. But the main reason why they, have, why they are in exile is because they have broken God's heart. So we have the prophets with a broken heart expressing the heart of God that has been broken. All right? And to show you that, again, tracing ideas and main ideas, repeated ideas, 
uh, tracing it through the book will help you see these things. And of course, as a DBS student, you don't have the time for that, so I have done the work for you, all right? To, to, to show really that it, that is true, that this is really a main idea in the book. And let me explain. That the, that the covenant's been broken, Jeremiah extensively explains. And so here we have, and again, don't write it all down. I, I, I will, I have internet now, so soon I can email it to Austin. But this is just to show you, we get 10 commandments. In fact, we had, uh, last Thursday night, we were, uh, the speaker was speaking about the 10 commandments, all right? So they're on your left, and on, on your right are all the references, all the scripture references that show that Jeremiah, that Jeremiah is explaining, you have broken every single one of those commandments. All right? And so Jeremiah is explaining that. You have broken all of the law of God. All right? So the covenant is broken. All right? But the main sin is not that the covenant's been broken. The main sin is that they have broken God's heart. So it, has, it is much more personal. Okay? It is much more personal because the Bible says they have forsaken God and so God is hurting God entered into a relationship with Israel God wanted to be like a husband to Israel God wanted to be like a father to Israel but the children have rejected daddy the husband, the wife has committed adultery and has left her husband that is how God feels, being abandoned and so, again, look at all the scriptures. Now, I hadn't, didn't have time to put it in the new Bible, in the new Living Translation. So these are in the new Revised Standard Version, just because I ran out of time, all right? But it, you, you get the message. So the, the rendering in your Bible might be slightly different. But look at how many times it says, that God says through Jeremiah, they have forsaken me. And I will utter my judgment against them for all their wickedness in forsaking me. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. All right? I was a fountain of living water for them, but they have forsaken me. How can I pardon you? Your children have forsaken me. So even the children of the parents have forsaken me. Now it goes on throughout the whole book of Jeremiah. Why has the Lord our God done all these things to us? You shall say to them, as you have forsaken me and forsaken God, you shall now serve strangers in the land that is not yours. So again, God it's, has become very personal to God. Then you shall say, say to them, it be, it's because your ancestors have forsaken me in, in chapter 19, because the Lord, because the people have forsaken me, that is why I'm doing this to them. All right, so, so there are many, many scriptures uh, indicating that the people, that, that God has taken it very personal for Israel to have abandoned him. All right, what is the, the greatest of the commandments? It's that you love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. That's a personal thing. It's both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we are to continue to love God with our mind, heart, and soul. It's all about relationship, not only in the New Testament, also in the Old Testament. It was always about relationship. It is not a duty-driven religion that we are talking about. It is about a heart-driven relationship that God is seeking in His people. And when people are rejecting Him, God is hurting. The word heart is repeated many times in, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, all right? About the heart and the condition of the heart, all right? And so what is the heart? In the Hebrew mind, the heart is the, the uh, like the deeper, it is, it is, with your heart you express the deeper issues, okay? It's, the heart expresses something deeper than just external behavior. It is the center of our feeling and intellect, according to the Hebrew mind. It is the richest biblical term for man's inner nature. For man's, it is also the seat of the will, like you make your decisions according to your heart. All right, the seat of the will. All right, it's, it, the, the, the decisions that you make uh, uh, shows what, where your heart is at. 
all right? It shows where your heart, heart is at, okay? It's the center of our feeling and intellect, all right? There is a lot that the Bible says about the heart, all right? Again, tracing something else, okay? Tracing something else. God says, because you have forsaken me. What are the people saying? Some of the skits were also expressed like that, especially the ones that were in Egypt. And they said, even though they had Jeremiah ask God for 10 days, and then finally the word of the Lord came, and then said, we know it's the word of the Lord, but we are not going to listen. And so there's another repeated idea. Constantly, the people are saying, Judah says, I will not listen. They are not obeying my voice, God says. Not obey the voice of the Lord, Jeremiah says in chapter 3. Their ears are closed. They do not, you do not listen. You did not listen. You did not obey or incline your ear. Refuse to hear my words. Refusing, not just listening, not listening, but refusing, being adamant about it to not listen. I am going to be stubborn. I'm going to harden my heart. They did not listen or incline their ear, would not hear or receive instructions. They are refusing to hear my words. You said, I will not listen. So there, there is that stubbornness. They, are, they, are, they broke the covenant and they have hardened their hearts. More. You have not listened many more times. You would not, they would not listen. Your ancestors did not listen. So it is repeated again and again and again. Neither the king, neither the, the king's servants, nor the people listen. So on every level, people would not listen on the bottom. And then interestingly, when the, the, the Jerusalem is under siege and the armies, the Babylonians armies are surrounding Jerusalem and then we see there is a conversation going on between the commander, the Babylonian commander to the people that are in Jerusalem on the wall and there is, they are talking and it's now for a Babylonian said you did not obey God's voice. So even the Babylonians are expressing this is about to happen to you because you have not listened. You have been so stubborn your heart is hardened. You are very adamant about being not listening. You have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. You do not listen or climb your ear. As for the words, this is what the people were saying in Egypt. As for the words, oh, are about to go to Egypt. As for the words that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we are not going to listen to you, Jeremiah. All right? So they are very, very, very adamant about it. And yet, God constantly still reaches out to them. Even though the people are refusing, God reaches out to them with persistence. And so God is persistence. And so again, a main I and an idea that is being repeated over and over again. I spoke to you, how? Persistently. I persistently sent all my prophets to you, day after day. I have spoken persistently to you. I persistently sent to you my servants the prophets again. I repeat, I myself have spoken to you persistently. All right, and again in 44 verse 4. So it is like that insist God said, even though the people are rejecting God, God keeps on pursuing a, a people that he loves. All right, so it says in Jeremiah chapter 3, I thought of myself, I thought to myself, I would love to treat you as my own children, God says. I wanted nothing more than to give you this beautiful land, the finest possession in the world. I looked forward to you calling me father, and I wanted you never to turn from me. But you have been unfaithful to me, you people of Israel. You have been like a faithless wife who leaves her husband. I, the Lord, have spoken. So can you see how God feels? All right, is Jeremiah doing a good job expressing how God feels? I think he does. All right. So why is the book of Jeremiah in our Bible? Well, so that we can learn from Judah's mistake. Judas, Judah did not learn from Israel's mistake. Remember, Israel is already in exile. 722 already has happened. But Judah did not learn from the mistakes of Israel. 
Will we learn from the mistakes that Judah is making? Or are we going to make the same mistakes? Jeremiah 2 verse 25 says, The people are saying, it is hopeless. Okay, it is, uh, here is in the bottom. It is hopeless. When will you stop running? When will you stop painting, uh, panting after other gods? But you say, in the ESV it says, it is hopeless. Here it says, save your breath. You know, spare your, your energy. I am in love with these foreign gods. And I can't stop loving them. So the people are keep on saying, while well, God is pursuing a people he loves, the people are saying, ah, sorry, save your time, go do something else. I can't help myself but love the, God, the, the false gods. And so what we are seeing is that uh, what is being presented here <coughs> is that uh, of a divorce, as we also saw in the skit. Okay, a divorce is taking place. All right. Um, the, the, the covenant is being done with. All right. God presents a picture of a divorce. The people are divorced from God. All right. And so when you have a divorce, then the contract is n n nil and void. All right. When you have a divorce, the wedding certificate can be tossed out. It's gone. All right. And so what we are seeing is because of this, because the covenant is broken and the covenant is broken and because of God's heart being broken. And so there is a divorce that has taken place. And so there is now a divorce that is complete because the covenant has ended. Has ended. All right. Now you may say, well, yo, but when I look at the timeline, 539 is only just around the corner. The Israel will continue to exist. All right. But you need, you need to understand what the apostles, what the people, what the apostles in the New Testament are explaining is that a lot of the things that are happening in the Old Testament is a picture and a foreshadow. It's a prophecy of what God is going to do, what God is going to do when we come to the new covenant. To give you an example, right here we have seen that God takes Egypt, I mean uh, Israel, out of Egypt. And so they are set free from slavery. And yes, 539 will happen. There will come a time that they will be set free from Babylon. All right. By the way, here we see a nation that is now in 1446 BC. We see a nation will come out of Egypt. A whole nation will come out of Egypt. But then when they come out of Babylon, we will see in 539 BC, and it is only a small remnant that will ever return. So among the big nation of Israel, only a minority, few of the Israelites, the descendants, physical descendants of Abraham, only a remnant returns. All right, but what is it a picture of? Well, for example, Paul in Romans is saying that is a picture of us being delivered from sin. And so now we see the church coming out of sin, being rescued, which happened since the cross at around 30 AD. So yes, there is still a returning to the land. There is still, we're going to read next week about Ezra and Nehemiah, that they rebuilt, that they will rebuild the land, they will rebuild Jerusalem, they in fact will rebuild a temple. All right? But what Paul says is, it is also an indication, just as they were delivered from, from Babylon, we now are delivered from sin. Yes, the church, uh, the, the temple is rebuilt, by the way, and we're going to study that. For example, next week, Tuesday, my pastor will come and speak, and for example, he will teach the, 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 uh, the book of Haggai. But what happens in the book of Haggai, when the temple is built, the people will be weeping. Why will the people be weeping? Because the temple is like a joke compared to the original temple. But not only that, what we also see in Haggai is that the Holy Spirit never will come down and fill the temple again. Whereas when we had the initial temple, the Temple of Solomon, God filled that temple as he filled the tabernacle. But now things are different. Yes, they are coming out of Babylon, but the Holy Spirit never comes down again. 
and, and even though Haggai would say the latter splendor of this temple will be greater than the former, the latter glory of this temple will be greater than the former, it never happened at that time. It only happened when Jesus walked into the temple, when the Shekinah glory of God finally filled the temple again. And when he walked out of that temple, he said, this temple is going to be destroyed. I am building a new temple, which is the church. Whoa. Come on. All right? Good. I feel like preaching today. <laughs> so that is like a big picture overview right there. All right? And so it says, um, the problem that the people have and the problem that needs fixing is the, the heart. They have a heart disease. All right. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. That is what they were called to do. But as I already read earlier, they can't help themselves but run after false gods. So they got a problem. All right, and so what it is is here is the primary stipulation of the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. All right, the primary stipulation of the Mosaic Covenant was that the people have a heart after God. The primary condition of the people of Judah's sins in the days of Jeremiah was that uh, their hearts were not turned towards God. That was their primary sin. It was always about relationship. New Testament, also Old Testament. It always was. Even though you read about all these rules and laws, God always was longing for that heart. They wanted, he wanted the people that loved him with all of their heart, soul, and strength. But they didn't. They refused, as I just showed you. They kept insisting, I will not listen. They have hardened their hearts. So they got a heart disease. All right. And so the calling is, you, God ought to circumcise, his, circumcise yourself to the Lord, to remove the foreskin of your heart. Well, you can't do that physically. It's spiritually. It is something that you do, that not in rules and regulations and laws. It is an expression of the heart. Okay, that is what God is looking for and could not find. These are all in Jeremiah. I, uh, again, because I ran, off I ran out of time, so I, I'm quoting out of the New Revised Standard Version, but I'm sure the New Living Translation is similar. So every, every time you see that on the top New Revised Standard Version, it's just like it's not exactly the same in your Bible. All right, O Jerusalem, wash your heart clean of wickedness, is what Jeremiah says. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious Heart. So again, it's a condition of the heart. There is a problem of a heart disease. But have stubbornly followed their own hearts, have gone, have gone after the bales, as their ancestors taught them. So they stubbornly, they're very stubborn. All right? Going after what their heart desires. All right? E Egypt, Judah, Edom, the Ammonites, Moab, and all these with shaven temples who live in the desert, for all these nations are uncircumcised. But the problem is, Israel is also uncircumcised. That is, in their heart. All right? You are near in their mouth. Oh, you know, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, they would say in Jeremiah 7. Oh, we love God. Sometimes we do that in church too. But their hearts are far from me, God says. Yet they're, they're yet far from their hearts. God, okay, God is far from their hearts. The sin of Judah is written with an iron pen. Where? On their hearts. Okay? They, the sins are engraved on tablets of their hearts. They got a problem with their hearts. Whose hearts turn away from the Lord. Okay? It's not just an accident. It's not like, oops, I didn't know. I broke a law. No, their hearts have turned away from God. And I can go on. It's really a heart disease. It's really something that is like a main theme in the book of Jeremiah. The heart is devious above all else. It's perverse. Who can understand it? But your eyes and heart are only on your dishonest gain for shedding innocent blood and for practicing oppression and violence, who stubbornly follow their own hearts, who prophesy the deceit of their hearts. 
and it goes okay so yeah we are done <laughs> okay so we have this problem and it is called a heart disease <coughs> all right but there will come a time that this is going to be fixed Jeremiah says the old covenant didn't work it did not reached into the level that God desired and that is the heart so therefore God Jeremiah says there will come a day that there will be a new covenant all right and that new covenant under that new covenant what is God going to do God is going to fix the heart all right I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding I give them a heart to know that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return to me with their whole heart but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my law within them and I will write on their hearts the law will be written not on paper but on their hearts Holy Spirit will bring conviction of, of sin into my heart I will write on their hearts I will be their God and they shall be my people I will make an everlasting covenant with them never to draw back from doing good to and uh, never to draw back from doing good to them and I will put the fear of me in their heart so that they may not turn from me so God is promising a covenant that will be truly everlasting that will not come to an end it is not pending pending on the condition of us like before with the Sinai covenant it's like if you obey you will I will bless you so there is a condition to the covenant and they broke that covenant and so it is no longer enforced it's now it's gone with it's it, the the wedding certificate is torn but this one I will, I will never to draw back from doing good to them and I will put the fear of me, the fear of God in their hearts where? in their hearts, not in behavior not just for show, but in their hearts so that they may not turn from me so God will do something much deeper alright? alright, good so, so there will come a time there will come a time, and I already read this, 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 this passage, but I uh, make another comment about it. I thought, I would, uh, I, I thought how, how I would set you among my children and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful heritage of all the nation. And I thought that I would call, be, call you my father. God wanted to be a father to Israel. Do you know that God has never called, himself, called a, a, an individual in the Old Testament my child, my son? He called David, he called Do Moses, my servant. He never called David my child. God was always a father to the nation Israel, but now in the new covenant, God wants to become a father to you individually. All right, so there is, a, there is something else. Now we can become sons. Under the new covenant, we can become sons of God, children of God. J uh, John 1 verse 12. John 1, 1 verse 12 says, but to all, all who receive God, who believe in his name he gave him power to become children of God that is something not in the old but something in the new covenant that we truly can become children of God all right it's something that uh, that is that the Jews would never think of in the old covenant they think God is a father to the nation never a father of me but Jesus introduced that to the disciples and called pray to God says he said my father all right and so we followed followed along with that all right continue so under the new covenant under the new covenant we already did the skit and that is the powder and the clay the Lord gave another message to the Jeremiah he said go down to the potter's shop and I will I will speak to you there so I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel but the jar he was making did not turn out as he hoped so he crushed it into a lump of clay and started all over again then the Lord gave me this message O oh Israel can I, do, can I not do to you as this potter has done to this clay? 
as the clay in the potter's hand, so are you not in my hands? If I announce to a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I had planned. And if I announce, I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom. But then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me. I will not bless it as I said. I would. As I, I, I will, yeah, I will, I will not bless it as I said I would. Therefore, Jeremiah, go and warn all Judah and Jerusalem. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. I am planning disaster for you instead of good. So turn from your evil ways each of you and you do what is right. But the people replied, don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as we want to, stubbornly following our own evil desires. That was the response. The no response of forget it. All right. Now, what do we see here in this story about the potter and the clay? All right. We picture yourself as you saw very well demonstrated. Okay. Uh, the potter working on that vase remember all right and making that whoever that was underneath it i forgot who it was making her very dizzy all right all right so so but what we are seeing is that this what what are we learning from this what is paul paul was using that in romans talking about the potter and the clay as well all right and it's it is the potter that transforms it is the potter that makes the difference not the clay all right not the clay the clay it's just a lump of clay but the lump of clay will turn into a vase who is in control god is in control the pot is in control paul says god is sovereign he does what he wants you are but clay all right that is the picture that paul gets out of jeremiah the house of israel is but clay it says in, in 18 verse 6 okay you are that clay O israel all right god can do what he wants god the potter is god and he can rework the clay as he has been doing as the potter has been doing when jeremiah was observing all right what is he saying don't assume once god's people always god's people god can change it depending on your actions god will not god will don't think god will always protect you he says to israel Okay, no matter what, even though you burn your children to false gods right outside the temple, and you think I'm going to still let, you know, accept that? No, God says. All right, but the people refused to listen. All right, and so, but at this particular picture that we have, this particular enacted symbol, there is still hope for Israel, don't we? It still says that you can still turn. Now, turn from your evil ways. So, because God is still, the, mo the, the clay is still soft. It still can yield to the hands of the potter. God is still at work at you, Israel. So, yield to the potter. Be that clay that yields. Don't resist, but yield to the potter's hand. And God can make something good out of it. Alright. Then we come to chapter 19 which is immediately after. So basically he saw the vision of the potter and the clay. The next vision is, or next uh, calling, the, the next thing that Jeremiah needs to do is go to that potter, perhaps the same potter, and buy a jar, all right? In the uh, ESV it is uh, a jug. I think in the uh, New Living Translation it says a jar. So buy a clay jar, it says, all right? That is number one instruction. Number two, bring some leaders with you and take them out of the city and go to this particular garbage dump okay which is called the valley of hinnom which is a valley just outside of jerusalem within earshot of the temple whatever is going on in the valley people can hear even when you're worshiping god in the temple and then give this message verses three to nine so uh, let me just go forward this is the, the, the center of the message that he is to give to the leaders that he has taken out and show them the garbage dump. And he says, For Israel has forsaken me and turned this valley into a place of wickedness. And in fact, you guys already read it in the sign and, and when you guys were acting it out. The people burn incest to foreign gods. 
idols never before acknowledged by this generation, by their ancestors or by the kings of Judah. And they have filled this place with blood of innocent children. They have built pagan shrines to Baal and they burned their sons as sacrifices to Baal. Can you imagine? You are worshipping God in the temple and you hear the screaming of babies that are burned just outside in another shrine. That was going on. And God says, I, it never even, has even come to my mind that you would do some, something like that. And so there is judgment. And says, so this garbage dump will, will become the valley of slaughter. Okay? This garbage dump will no longer be called Tophet or the valley of Ben Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. But for I will upset the, I will upset the careful plans of Judah and, Jer and Jerusalem. I will allow the people to be slaughtered by invading armies and I will leave their dead bodies as food for the vultures and wild animals. All right? Because Israel has gone too far, God says. What else does God say? All right, so we are again right here. That was the message they just gave, right? And so now we have Jeremiah had bought that, that jar. Remember, he had not, not done anything yet with that jar. He only gave that message to the people. And to really make a real impact to the people, he would just go and smash the jar right in their front of them. I wish I had bought a jar at Walmart and do it right here in the classroom just for special effects. All right? He smashed it in front of them. Okay? He smashed the jar and gave them another message. And what is the message? Verses 11 to 13 and said this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says as this jar lies shattered so I will shatter the people of Judah and Jerusalem how beyond all hope of repair whereas in the previous sign there was still that opportunity for the potter to mold the clay but now he bought a vase and the clay has hardened it can no longer yield anymore to the hands of the potter. It can no longer yield anymore to the hands of God. And because of the sins that they have committed, God says, I did this, this is what's going to happen. Again, old covenant is dead. Judaism has come to an end. There is no hope. It is beyond repair. Now, <clears throat> and so and then and, and then he says and then go to the city and basically give the same message in the city so the same curse that is upon the valley will now also come upon the temple and the city he's, he's giving that message in the city in front of the temple all right that it's going to happen all right now the question then again is when is it being fulfilled remember when there is a prophecy we are asking ourselves, is it fulfilled? And when is it fulfilled? Or is it still to be fulfilled in our future? Which day of the Lord are we talking about? That is the question. All right. Now, I have some ideas. Some people say, all right, because what it says, it says beyond all hope or repair, Okay, because of that phrase, it says beyond all hope and, uh, of repair. The question is, is it 586? Now again, this is interpretation, I don't know for sure. But let me just reason with you what I think. And so people say, maybe it's 586. All right, it's judgment. It really happened when Babylon came in and, 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 and destroyed the city. There were corpses everywhere. There were corpses that were in the valley and they were, nobody was getting a proper burial. They were being, like basically the bodies were to be fed by to the birds. All right, just a typical uh, uh, scene of a, a battlefield where the, uh, all the corpses are laying on the floor, on the ground, and then the wild animals come and the birds are coming. That is what is being pictured here. All right, however, the city and the temple is being rebuilt, although the temple will never be filled with the Holy Spirit again in the Old Testament, all right? So is it 586? Or, which I am leaning towards, I think it actually is maybe in 586, but maybe, and let me reason with you, maybe it is 70 AD. 
Because in 70 AD, also the same thing happened. Do you know that it happens in the same day? Do you know that on the same day the Romans in destroyed Jerusalem? Maybe, the, the, maybe Caesar was just waiting for that day and then ha made it happen. But there was again a siege of one and a half years. Actually, there was a Jewish war going on for three and a half years. I think the siege was one and a half years and then the city was destroyed. All right, the city was destroyed. And the temple is never being rebuilt. Not that it made a difference, because I already know from 539 onwards, God never dwelt in the temple anymore. Now, Jesus says, I will, in three days I will rebuild this temple. And he himself resurrected, and that was the beginning of the church. And now the Holy Spirit dwells in the church, being the temple of the Holy Spirit. All right, that is what Jesus was saying. So I would say maybe it is 70 AD because this prophecy is, what is being stressed is, is the jar is beyond repair. It's beyond repair. Maybe you can fix it and put glue in it, but it will be temporary. We are waiting for Jesus to come to make something new, to make something permanent. Now, it did happen, basically Jesus did die in 30 AD. Right, and he rose from the dead, and the church began, but the people were still going to the temple to worship. In fact, the Christians, the Jewish Christians, still go to the temple and worship. I mean, Peter, Peter, Peter and John walked to the temple for their daily prayer, and then he saw a man, uh, a leopard, or, or somebody sick, uh, uh, crippled. He saw at the gate of the temple, and he rose him. He, uh, he healed him right there on the spot. All right, why? They were on the way to pray in the temple. They don't know yet. They didn't have all the revelation yet that we now get and that, that the Holy Spirit has given also later. And that is basically, and that is what we read in Hebrews, okay, 30 AD, the old covenant is vanishing. It is absolute. It is soon disappearing. But it's still there. But in 70 AD, it was like the last nail in the coffin. After 70 AD, Judaism never, never became any more, I mean, basically it's really ended, Judaism. Later Judaism is totally different from Old Testament Judaism. Okay, what is made by the rabbis in later times, they, are the, they, they use the oral traditions to create a new form of Judaism, which is very different from Old Testament Judaism. All right, Judaism has come to an end and that the old covenant has come to an end and so we now are under the new covenant. Yeah, but because in the Hebrew, in the letter of the Hebrews, the, the, the Hebrews were being persecuted so it was easy to go back to Judaism because we are serving the, only, the same God, Jehovah, but the author said don't do that because it's obsolete soon and he's pre prophesying predicting 70 AD soon it's going to be gone so don't fall back on Judaism stay with Jesus even though you're being persecuted yes you're serving you're worshiping the same Jehovah but you gotta have to say, stay with Jesus because it, only through Jesus is it's going to work now because the old covenant has been done with and so we have many new passages uh, new covenant passages all right passages of hope and passages that explain the need of a new heart and so i will not be angry with you forever i will give you shepherds after my own heart i will not blot out you completely i will return and have compassion on all of them i will bring them back to this land that i gave to their ancestors all right i, I have stubbornly they have the problem they have stubbornly followed their own hearts and have gone out after these bells but oh lord who judges rightly, who righteously, who try the heart and mind. Lord, you know my heart, you see me, and know my thoughts. And so here we definitely see there is something going to happen under the new covenant, and that relates to a heart. The people are in need of a new heart, of their heart being fixed. Now, let me show you this in a separate page, all right, because it doesn't fit on the PowerPoint. And I also will put that in the Dropbox for you to have. But so here what you see is there are many hope passages throughout Jeremiah. Many hope passages throughout Jeremiah, yeah? What we also see is there are many passages 
that are explaining the need for a new heart all right and then there is in the center I have the new covenant message because that really is the main idea that this is like a, 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 the center of the book and everything else kind of like radiates towards that and that is these whole passages that are sp sparsely scattered throughout the text the, these passages about the need of a new heart is sparsely centered around uh, is around all, everywhere in the text now we also have new covenant messages everywhere but especially in chapter 30 to 33 which we call the book of comforts or the little book of comforts compared to the book of Isaiah that has the big book of comforts it's all about what is God's going to do with the new covenant all right <clears throat> oh yeah I need to go back to the PowerPoint so as you see there are many but I'll give that to you we don't have to dwell on this for very long because it can't, I can't show it very well on the um, PowerPoint. The fierce, uh, the fierce anger of the Lord will not diminish until it has finished all he has planned. In the days to come, you will understand it. So here's Jeremiah is saying is, his judgment will continue and you are not going to understand it now. Just like Habakkuk. I don't know what you're doing, God, but I have to do it by faith I am going to be you know Paul uh, the Hebrew says he will be justified by faith Habakkuk is seeing the Babylonians coming I can't explain it Jeremiah probably couldn't explain it either it is only Isaiah I believe that had a, had the best possible picture of the Messiah uh, even more than Jeremiah but Jeremiah is the only one that had the picture of a new covenant all right <clears throat> also here as of me and I will tell you remark remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come so it's going to be a mystery for the prophets of old but it will be explained to the people in the New Testament in the church it is for our benefit Peter says that these things have been written and so we the promise is of a new covenant the promise is of a better covenant the law was harsh and cruel but the New Testament explains that the law is there to point us to Jesus all of the Old Testament all of the Old Testament history provides us with a clear picture that the people cannot survive the people cannot make it without God and so Jeremiah says something new is needed a new arrangement a new arrangement is needed a new kingdom is going to be established under a new covenant yeah and so in in that new kingdom when do we read return home you wayward children says the Lord for I am your master I will bring you back to the land of Israel and remember as when we read that we know that, that the Apostles in the New Testament explained that that is the church they didn't understand that but the physical returning to the promised land is now spiritual fulfilled in the church all right of course every Israelite is welcome to believe in Jesus and, and join in actually we are joining in with Israel I should say all right because Israel means the people of God all right. I will bring you back to the land of Israel one from this town and two from that family from wherever you are scattered and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will guide you with knowledge and understanding and when, you're, and when your land is once more filled with people says the Lord you will no longer wish for the good old days quote unquote when you possess what? the ark of the Lord's covenant what is the ark? in the ark is what? the law the covenant the old covenant the law what's on top of the ark it's the throne who is above the ark is the presence of God you don't have no need of that anymore Jeremiah says you will not miss those days or even remember them 
and there will be no need to rebuild the ark. In that day, Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. All nations, talking about the new Jerusalem, all nations will come there to honor the Lord. They, they will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. That stubbornness, I will not listen, is gone with, is done with. In those days, the people of Judah and Israel will return together from exile in the north. They will return to the land I gave to your ancestors as inher inheritance forever. All right, clearly that is talking about the church because the, the, the tribes in the north, we call that the 10 lost tribes. They are really lost. They don't exist anymore, all right? And so it is, again, what Paul says in the New Testament, that is fulfilled among us in the church. We now are on, like in Isaiah, we are on that highway. And we are going, we are seeing people from Assyria going to Egypt. What? To do what? To worship God. We see people on that highway going from Egypt to Assyria. To do what? To worship God. We have the church everywhere in the world worshiping God. That is the picture that's being given in Isaiah and as well in Jeremiah. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> so there is a new order, and the new order is different from the, from the old. How is it different? It is different because now God will be your father. Now everyone will know God. You know, whereas was every individual will know the Lord. All right? The day is coming, says the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the, like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, okay? Though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord, but this is the new covenant I will make with, with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instruction deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives saying, you should know the Lord for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their weaknesses and I will again, I will never again remember their sins. Which is, by the way, quoted word for word in Hebrews. It is the longest Old Testament quote that we find in the New Testament. It's about the new covenant. Everyone will now know God. Whereas in the old days, remember we wondered sometimes, how come that God judges a whole family or a whole tribe or a whole nation? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And we wonder why that is. But then even in Ezekiel, we come, that, we come to that when Joe Faring will share it on Thursday. In Ezekiel, if the prophet will say, you know what, you will be held respond responsible individually for your sins. Not because of your father, but you will be, not because, you can't blame your parents. But you will be held responsible for your action, for your sins, all right? You can't say I'm a sinner because my parents are. Just as you can't say you're a good guy because my parents were. Look at Manasseh, he was bad. Josiah, he was great, all right? So responsibility is moving towards, responsibility is moving away from corporate responsibility, nation, to individual responsibility as well. So there is an individual responsibility, but there is also an individual privilege. We all get to know God personally. God truly is, remember what we said, God wanted to be the king of Israel, and it didn't work. The people rejected God. But now God will become your and my king. All right, in the new covenant, in the kingdom of God, God is on the throne in your and my heart. He rules. He truly rules. All right? <clears throat> I, will give them, I will give them hearts that recognize me as the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me wholeheartedly. And so that highway is open that Isaiah talked about. By the way, Jeremiah also talks about it. That ancient path, that one way to God is open. God called Moses my servant, called David my servant. He never called them my son. This father-son relationship was exclusively used between God and the nation Israel. But today he calls us father. 
all right? The new covenant restores the relationship of the heart. New covenant makes intimacy with God possible. For every individual, you can know God. How? Through Jesus. What happened? On the eve that Jesus was crucified, after the supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So it was this moment in time, the new covenant was instituted. And it was done by, with blood, the blood of Jesus. All right? But now, Jesus, our high priest, has been given a, a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who medita mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. And so the author of Hebrews says that Jesus became the mediator of a better covenant, a more excellent ministry. He is the mediator of a better covenant enacted with better promises. And in that, in that time, it says in Jeremiah 33, verse 34, I will put my law within them. I will write them on their hearts. All now can know God. Forgiveness is for all. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24 to 25, Paul talks about having communion. Okay, when we have communion, we remember this new covenant with Jesus. And so he invites the Corinthians to join him, to join in with him, remembering what? The new covenant. And then in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6, Paul says, he is teaching the Corinthians that they are now ministers of what? They are to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So that others also may become partakers of the new covenant. A new covenant that began with Jesus, as was already explained in Hebrews. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. And when God found fault with the people in the time of Jeremiah, when they were burning their children in the valley, in, and so forth, so in 586 BC, okay, God says, enough. And there will now come a new covenant. And so he quotes exactly verbatim, word for word, from the book of Jeremiah that we already read. And then the Hebrew author concludes, when God speaks of a new covenant, it means that he made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear, 70 AD. And so here we have, perhaps the greatest revelation in the book of Jeremiah is that of this new covenant. In closing, let's go back to the potter one more time. As I said, Paul was quoting, alluding to this. And as I should the thing that was created say to the one who created, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have a right to use the lump of clay to make one jar for decoration? Other Bible translations say honorable use. Another to throw, to throw, another to throw garbage into, meaning like for dishonorable use. Like, is it not up to the potter? Can he not decide? And so what Paul is saying is that the potter is God. And we are but clay. And as clay, Paul says, we can't say to God, Hey, why, do you, why are you making me like this? All right. Psalm, the psalmist says in Psalm 103, verse 14, it says, we are but dust of the ground. That is how God created us. We are just but dust from the ground. We are the clay. God is sovereign. 
He is the potter. There is probably no clearer image anywhere in the Bible about the sovereignty of God. The picture of the potter working on the clay. And yet there is resistance to accept the sovereignty of God. In the West, we champion freedom. In Holland and in America, all right? We have freedom to protest, freedom, for, to, freedom of speech, freedom to choose. You 